Welcome to the Academy of Esports podcast. I'm your host, James O'Hagan. I'm with Kevin Mitchell. He's the Director of Business Development and Strategic Intelligence at National Amusements, which is a, maybe you've not heard of it, but you've heard of CBS Viacom. Well, National Amusements is an arm of the uh, CBS Viacom family under this uh, Redstone family. He's also a professor at Emerson College, where I think uh, he does quite a bit with esports and is involved with the uh, CEX uh, College Esports uh, Expo. Kevin, thank you for being on the Academy of Esports podcast today. James, so happy to have uh, finally connected and uh, joined uh, the accomplished <laughs> Academy of Esports. I mean, this is incredible. Thanks for having me. Well, we've we've connected. I know we've talked. It's been probably now a year and a half, maybe a year ago that we we talked and you were telling me, hey, you need to come out for CEX and you need to come out for CEX. And I and I couldn't do it at the time. And and now it's like, you know, CEX passed in February and now we're, you know, on lockdown. And it's like, whoo, you know, well, if, if that opportunity comes, I'm taking that opportunity in February uh, to come out uh, to Boston for that. But, um, you know, your, your experience isn't just starting with CEX and your experience isn't so much, uh, you, you know, a lot of people in the collegiate ranks have been previous gamers. Um, your experience is a little bit of a different pathway to get to esports. So briefly, if you could share with us how you found yourself going from being a director of business development and strategic intelligence for National Amusements to heading up uh, a, an esports conference like the Collegiate uh, Expo. Well, I, I do uh, have a very unique story. Uh, I actually started out in the music industry. Uh, so uh, I did everything from talent acquisition to promotions to marketing. And my first intersection with gaming was actually placing songs in NBA Live and Madden uh, and placing my artist talent into, uh, you know, the score of video games. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... Uh, Relatively eight years ago, I was asked by a, a developer in Austin to be a domain expert for a game that was GTA meets The Sims, but a music industry version. So that's Saturday quite a Rome. that's quite an interesting <laughs> put together there. Yeah, it, it was this the, the the notion was to create a game that had this real life simulation. Uh, that The Sims had in terms of creating a career. So mm -hmm. it was centered around the music industry. And the idea for me was to uh, answer questions that the developers had about the day in the life of an artist, uh, a music exec. Uh, what type of scenarios would unfold when you're on tour? Uh, what type of scenarios when you went to a CD club or uh, driving down the street and hence the GTA effect? If you go to Miami to a music conference and you take a wrong turn, what could potentially happen? So <laughs> I would sit there for hours and eight to nine guys would say, hey, what happens if this happens? What do you do here? What's the day look like? What happens when you intersect with CD characters? And music industry is very, it's pretty much uh, athletes or these fringe characters uh, who mm. generally want to invest in the business. And a lot of them don't come from uh, uh, high standards of living in terms of employment. Generally, mm -hmm. they come from ec economically disadvantaged communities and they raise their capital from, you know, illegal means. So wow. you tend to, I, I like to compare my career as a promotion guy to being a reporter uh, embedded in Fallujah because uh, wow. I worked in particular with Def Jam Records uh, in, the, in the early 90s, right when West Coast hip hop took off. And my first gig out of college was, hey, take this group in a van from San Diego to Seattle over three weeks and stop at every college along the way, bring them to radio stations, uh, bring them to record stores. And by the way, keep them alive because they all are a gang affiliated. <laughs> so I was like... Uh, just tossed into this world where I had to navigate through these communities, uh, South Central LA and all these areas. I, I read books on gang culture so I could read graffiti and, and understand where I was environmentally mm -hmm. and then navigate between uh, secondhand cannabis smoke, alcohol, weapons. And I was responsibly responsible for bringing groups from A to B. And there were times when I was in dangerous situations and I would call my boss in New York and say, hey, uh, I'm the only guy without a gun. This seems dangerous. <laughs> and everybody has drugs. Is there any way I can? And he said, basically, look, there's 20 people that'll take your job. You can come home and resign or you can stick it out. 
Wow. So I decided to stick it out. Uh, life got better. As well, wait, I, wait, I'm hold on, part. hold on. I have questions. <laughs> okay. We can't, we can't leave this part of your story without me asking a couple of questions. Hold on. Sure. I'm going to take a guess and you tell me if I'm warm or not. Okay. Early nineties, Def Jam records, three members. Was it De La Soul? I did work with De La Soul through Rush Management. But okay. They were assigned to Tommy Boy Records. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry about yes. that. Now, yes. my, all I'm picturing and what you're talking about is two movies, right? I am picturing Fear of a Black Hat. Okay. I don't know if you ever saw that, but it, to, yes, pe people put Fear of a Black Hat and CB4 together. I'm like, no, 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 not CB4. Fear of a Black Hat for me is where it's at. And the other one I'm picturing is Get Him to the Greek, which is you know, uh, where they yes. have to take uh, Russell... Um, uh, I Russell, forget his... uh, the British guy. Carl. Yeah. No, Russell. no, not Carl. Uh, I know the British guy. The, but it's to get him from, Katie yeah, it's Curry. to get him from London to Los Angeles to the Greek theater and all the yes. shenanigans of, of that. Yes. That combined with straight out of Compton. Okay. <laughs> that was uh, PTSD for me. Uh, wow. Literally. Cause I had to learn that even though there's green grass and people are cutting their lawns and there are butterflies, you're still in Compton and there's a high chance of violence that could just break out at any moment. You can't use payphone booths. You can't stop at an outdoor hot dog stand and end up like Boys in the Hood or Menace Society. Mm -hmm. Those were the big pictures that were uh, driving culture at the time. And I lived it, you know, uh, but I, I came from the East Coast, so I wasn't prepared. Uh, I had to, you know, it was a, a on the job training. It's almost like going through boot camp and you're flying to Vietnam. Uh, well, so. But yeah. that I grew up in California, and I know I grew up in Northern California. Uh, I was in high school, late '80s, early '90s, and I followed heavily uh, West Coast rap culture. And coming from the East Coast, it's surprising that they would put you with a West Coast gang or not gang, but group, just because there was that real difference between East Coast and West Coast at the time. Those things did not really, you know, jive together for a very long time. It wasn't until maybe the mid '90s or late '90s when East Coast and West Coast rap kind of came together. Um, so it's really yeah, surprising coming true. from Boston or the, I assume you're from the Boston area coming to Los Angeles and, and again, having to learn just how different it really was. Yeah. And a lot of it had to do with the uh, Def Jam started a West coast division and no one had the experience that uh, to really understand that it was completely different than New York rap. Mm -hmm. I had worked as a, a CBS and Sony college rep and I worked with groups like above the law for ruthless records. Um, I was handling all the college radio, which was the, you know, premier radio at the time. Hip hop was only on a few commercial stations like mm -hmm. KML oh, yeah. and uh, so on. K so KML, K K KML yeah. 106.1 KML. Yes. That was I, my I station in San Francisco. I've known Sway Calloway since those days. Uh, that's how far I go back. And, and like all the E40 and the Vallejo, like I know California. You were talking my language. Yo, yeah. Di people yeah. just think Digital Underground was the Humpty Dance and they don't even know. I, I was on tour with Digital Underground and with Third Base and Queen Latifah. And okay. Tupac was a member of Digital yep. Underground. He was a, well, he started as a backup dancer. And, yeah. and Third Base had... Um, uh, MC Search. Yeah, It'd well, nice. I'm, I'm but I'm thinking yeah. I, I know the I know the group and I know, oh, God, I know some of the songs off the top. I just haven't thought of them in, in for so long. But you give me Digital Underground. You, I, I'm telling you, man, it's I, <laughs> you're speaking my language here. I'll just say that you're speaking my language. So that's fantastic. That's fantastic. I'm jealous. <laughs> but we, we are here to talk about. 90s yeah. hip hop. I mean, we should probably just do a whole separate podcast episode and just talk about 90s hip hop because I know that there's people who would love to listen to that. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, <laughs> we could do a, an entire episode about the correlation between emerging hip hop and esports and how there were a lot of similarities in terms of it being a subculture. Well, let's get uh, into that then, because because I think yeah. well, I think the collegiate scene and the pro scene is a lot of that right now. Uh, like the people that you see who are given who are being given leadership positions. You know, I look at some of the people who who do have leadership roles at collegiate levels and even pro levels, and I just go, I go, okay, that's that's not what I'm used to, right? That's sure. especially when you're talking about, um, you know, a lot of these people now are starting to equate esports into regular sports, but you know, regular sports is a whole different type of 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 business and mindset. Um, it's more traditional, old school. This seems like, hey, we're going to do business our own way. Kind of like how in the 90s rap was like, we're going to do business our own way and you better either, you know, uh, 
you better figure it out because if you can't, you, we're just going to leave you behind. Absolutely. There's a lot of similarities in terms of traditional sports looking down at esports and it, it's not a real game. And the same with music. It's not real hip hop. I mean, it's not real music. You're sampling or taking old music and repurposing it. It just, it's not organic. There's nothing live. So there's a, a lot of similarities, especially with the subculture where you never realize how big it is until you immerse yourself in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, like I had no idea about the Bay Area sound until you know, E-42 short, I did a lot of work with them. And in the South with the rap -a lot records with, you know, Ghetto Boys and not understanding like even Luke and all those guys in Miami, why did they like that type of music? But when you immerse yourself in that culture, you understand that, wow, you know, the type of uh, lifestyle that they lead really lends to them liking, you know, more bass in their music, uh, mm -hmm. the car culture, the gang culture, and this, the, uh, the immersion of the two. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of parallels. Yeah, well, and we're not saying that that esports is is gang culture and car culture and bass culture, you know. But there's what's great is there are elements of hip hop. I can see, especially '80s, '90s hip hop, and you can see the evolution of the entertainment industry and how esports. While the NBA has done, a, I think, a pretty good job of embracing the entertainment culture around that's grown up around it, and the NFL to some extent. Esports seems to be hand in hand with the entertainment culture. Like the games are there, the people are there, but like the clothes, the uh, promotions, the events, these these seem to be more like you have to be there rather than you have to watch. You have to be there and be part of it rather than watching and being part of it. Absolutely. In, in one of my uh, my my past jobs, uh, I worked with Shaq uh, when he rapped. Um, oh no, Fushnikins? No, you didn't. I, I actually got in after Fushnikins when uh, "You Can't Stop the Rain" when he started a record label. I helped to run his label, and That's but amazing. gaming was a huge part of it. I remember gaming with Cypress Hill, Ice Cube, and Shaq playing Tekken and betting Shaq a thousand bucks. Uh, I didn't have the money; he certainly did, and I got lucky. <laughs> And beat him two out of three and uh, in front of Cypress Hill and Ice Cube and they were breaking his balls and he was pretty <laughs> upset. And, and he got over it, gave me the money and I gave it back to him because I, I was had a working relationship with him. But sure. it was a big part of the culture. You know, the uh, hip hop records would be exposed to the audiences through EA, EA Sports and uh, NBA Live, Midway Games. Uh, when you think about all those car games, when you're switching the radio and like GTA or what have you, the music was the score and the soundtrack, very similar to a film. So I, I think there's a lot of correlation there. I have to say that um, while I did grow up liking things like Parliament Funkadelic, uh, Bootsy Collins, sure. uh, James Brown, um, I, I listened to a lot of funk and soul growing up just because my dad got me into all that stuff because he would listen to 50s and 60s music all the time. And the natural extension is then to slide into the Motown sound, which I really loved. And a movie that really spoke to me growing up was a movie called The Commitments, which is about a poor white I, Irish I, group that starts a I soul band. I know exactly band. what you're talking about. That was a and, great film. Classic. And they and their and their big hope is to meet Wilson Pickett, you know, in, in the movie, and yeah. he, he doesn't show up, but. That to me was the gateway to Motown and to funk. But what got me really to another level of getting into like that funk era stuff was uh, Grand Theft Auto Vice City because sure. it had it had that funk channel. And it was like songs yeah. I'm going, all right, I got to find out more about that. I've never heard this one before because it would, you know, it doesn't get played on radio and, and there wasn't Spotify and there wasn't Apple Music. Like you could just grab whatever you want. So that's where I picked up a lot of my, I guess, musical education too, is through games that you're talking about. Again, you, you talked about, you know, Madden. Yeah. Madden's got a whole score of music every year. You know, the, the number changes, but the score also changes too. So sure. that's, it's tremendous how you bring that up and you're connecting those together. Cause like I said, you're just kind of speaking a language that I know, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's something that it actually prepared me to adapt to esports. you know, because, you know, when I, my first, uh, I guess, beyond that experience being working with the game developer, I had my boss, a 65-year-old woman, who came in my office in 2015 and said, hey, we're going to start investing in esports. And my view was, hey, gaming's a subculture. You know, there's kids, you know, playing in basements. Uh, you know, I almost flunked out of college playing games, but I don't know what life beholds beyond that. 
And mm. she forced me to begin to look at all the trends in the culture in Korea, China. And that's when I was completely blown away by what had occurred at the Staples Center with the League of Legends uh, event. And it completely tra transformed me. And uh, it, it was the, that was me jumping out of the parachute and just really going all in on esports and, and trying to identify, um, you know, as an emerging trend, how does it intersect with the thin, with the cinema space? The mm -hmm. cinemas were digital. Can we bring this experience into the theater space? You know, what companies are on the horizon that are investable? You know, mm -hmm. um, our assets included Viacom, CBS, Paramount, Nickelodeon. Um, how can they get involved? And at the time, it was really early on. And Viacom was more focused on mainstream pop culture. So League of Legends didn't really fit uh, with the Nickel Nickelodeon or the MTV audience. Mm -hmm. So it was a struggle. But then we eventually connected with Super League. Uh, we were one of their first hosts uh, up in New England, and we began to test some events. We mm -hmm. have theaters in the UK. We did Call of, Call of Duty events and Halo events in theater. And uh, at that point, we were hooked on looking for ways to uh, converge the culture. It, it, and there is a lot of converge. And you know, I, I even see it, you know, movie theaters have a lot of downtime. I mean, You've got some, you know, I know that they play a lot of things, but I look at even the theater that we have in town, which is, um, it's a Marcus theater and Marcus is all through Wisconsin and, and the Midwest. Sure, I'm very familiar. And, uh, you know, when they, when, when these theaters started making the switch to digital, and I, and I, I think a lot of theaters started making it late to digital. I don't think they've really fully tapped exactly what they have as far as a performance space. I mean, they'll do things like they'll have, like Marcus will do special events where they show like the New York uh, opera, right? They'll show the, the you know, sure. live from Lincoln Center kind of thing, and they'll do a live simulcast in the theater. But, you know, I just look at this and go, wait a minute, you've got a digital projector back there. This is a giant screen. This is a place where all I need to do basically is if you can give me a couple of places to plug in, I have an event space right here that is set up and, and can be, it's got stadium seating. It can be a major esports event space, but I, I, it, I don't know what it's going to take. Maybe, you know, the COVID shutdown, you know, where people are like thinking about, well, maybe I don't want to go to the movies. Maybe now is the time where we start to see more of the shift where we're saying, hey, we need to diversify our business a little more in these theaters or, or something to that regard. Yeah, it's something that I was super passionate about. I looked for ways to, uh, I even met with the, the DreamHack and the ESL guys about uh, creating, when DreamHack first came to the U.S., you know, my idea was, can we create these mini dream hack experiences at the theater? You know, you'd have, you know, all the, uh, you know, the cosplay, the streamers, mm -hmm. the environment, right? And then stream some of the dream hack, uh, you know, masters events. And we, we really couldn't see eye to eye in terms of the, the value and the price point to mm -hmm. acquire that content. They rated the content at the European dream hack 20-year legendary status. And for us in America, it really didn't make sense financially because we value it at, hey, if there are 100 seats and the gross is $10, you know, it's $10 a seat and the gross is 1000 bucks, that's what you're working with in terms of profit. And mm. we really couldn't come up with the right uh, scenario financially. Uh, but it, it, uh, to your point, having digital projection, being located all over the U.S., Avatar literally dread, uh, led the adoption of digital cinema. Mm -hmm. You could not show Avatar if you didn't have digital projection. So there were a number of financing deals that were done by all the projection com companies to allow the theaters to digitize. So it was a, an absolute uh, you know, a, a win in terms of thinking about the underutilization. Theaters are used 35 to 40% of the week. Mm -hmm. Hey, kids will play during the week. And that's that was the Super League model. Monday night, League of Legends events, it was perfect. We were empty, there's popcorn, there's a community, everything's there. Uh, we set up right in the moat area, you know, uh, in front of the, the first row. Mm -hmm. Set yep. up a, you know, a modular setup. We've got the screen, you plug in, and it was a great fit. But I think the challenge was, you know, the theater industry has been under threat because of all the content consumption shifts, mm -hmm. OTT, um, serialized content, for example, and binge television watching. You know, how do you compete when you have a three hour film and it costs you 40 bucks to take your kids yeah. to watch that? But then you've got content that's just as good, if not better, like Game of Thrones that you can watch when you want. There's 12 episodes. 
the storyline, the characters are developed, and it's very difficult to compete with serialized content. Uh, there's so much specialization, there's so much variety. So I think the movie going experience itself kind of hit a wall because of the content. Just, I mean, how many Avengers, okay, where they all got beat up in New York, thrown through buildings, and then something, you know, strange happened. You can't tell one from the other. So the experience just got monotonous. So I think mm -hmm. that was a big challenge, too, because uh, most people don't realize that a movie theater generally makes a dollar per ticket. All their money is made through concessions, hence the $10 Pepsis. That's the only way we make money unless the, the, the films actually stay in the cinema for long periods of time, and then the scale raises. But if you've got a film that stiffs, I mean, you're basically uh, running an empty theater, and you have to commit to showing it seven times a day or what have you, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And if it's empty, it's empty. You can't pull that film because Disney will not give you four prints of, of Star Wars if you're pulling a touchstone film that's, you know, an artsy film. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, you still have to commit to showing, it's like the cable model. You have to commit to showing the bad films if you want the good ones. And the good well, ones pay all the bills. Well, and here's here's what's been running through my mind in all this, because again, we have a really cool space in Racine where we do have a gaming lounge, but obviously COVID, and this is maybe for educators to think about as well, not even if you don't have a gaming lounge in town, but having a an esports dedicated esports space, performance space, a space where people can come in and, and collaborate and play together is sometimes it works out well in a computer lab, but you know, things like state finals, uh, things like those one-off events where you need a, th you, if you just had a theater with a big screen and a place for people to come in, you don't need to do it necessarily at a school. Uh, and I know Mark, I will say this, like I said, Marcus, Marcus theaters has been welcomed to the idea, um, of, of hosting events like this. So if you are an educator who is looking like, how, how do we run this state competition? I mean, again, the food's already there and you know, kids, if you say, yeah. I'm going to bring, if I'm going to bring a thousand kids into a space for a state competition and they, and we know they're teenagers, they're going to eat, you know, that, that to me, it just seems like a win situation setup, especially if you can have maybe a few theaters. And again, you're talking about, but they're going to have to run movies. It's got to have to be like some kind of special rental or something. I don't know how this works, but given the dollars that are involved, a smart movie theater manager is going to try to figure out to make it work. Right. In yeah. Theory, and, and again, the, the challenges are the, the, the screen commitments. Cause again, mm -hmm. with Disney, the year before, uh, there's they generally will give you a slate that comes out a year in advance, mm -hmm. and they'll tell you, hey, we've got 40 films. There's six blockbusters that they'll show Memorial Day or holidays, and those are the ones that pay the bills. There's a few in the middle, and then there's these artsy films. You have to commit to all of them. So you could have 10 screens at a multiplex, right? Mm -hmm. And you have commitments on nine out of 10 of those screens. Even if nobody's in the audience, you still have to commit to showing them. If they're empty, you have to play them for 15 or 20 minutes and then cut them off. But it essentially blocks out the screen time. So sure. when it comes to doing um, esports events, you're you're basically battling with the programming team. That's like, look, I need that screen. I know you want to do the, what you talked about with the specialty events. That's called event cinema, where mm -hmm. they'll do the opera, they'll do the musicals, or UFC. Um, we've actually done that. My theater chain actually has a deal with Riot Games and, and a company called Piece of Magic in Europe. So we distribute championship League of Legends events, the LCS, mm -hmm. um, in theater through a satellite feed. So we actually distribute it throughout Europe, not only our theaters in, in uh, the UK, but throughout Europe. So we act as a distributor uh, using event cinema as the mantra. And that is the specialized programming where it may run once a week as an event, as opposed to the Hollywood pipeline schedule where it runs seven times a day, um, comes in on Wednesday or what have you. So we've actually been very progressive uh, in doing that uh, as a theater. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the, the challenge is the capital investment that it's going to take to build a multi-use space, uh, figuring out the challenges with the equipment. Um, every theater would have to be upgraded with Wi-Fi. Um, and uh, again, with so much of the economic model contingent upon concessions, it's okay with kids. We've got popcorn, peanuts, like how much are we going to really get? And is it all going to weigh out? And then the other challenge is really just 
publishers allowing uh, companies to operate these events. Super League had a, an exclusive deal with Riot. Mm -hmm. um, they started to kind of go along that track, and then Super League kind of pivoted to golf and all these other, um, you know, um, types of events. So they mm -hmm. kind of backed off the theater stuff. But I'll tell you, it worked. We did local. Uh, that was the really the first franchises in esports before the Overwatch League was the League of Legends franchises that were theater based. So mm. we operated the Boston franchise and the New York franchise, and there were 12 other cities that had locations. So the the students or the, the players that came into our theaters would be the Boston team. There's five levels, and they would play teams from other cities. Chicago won. Uh, the last two to three championships, they had one of the best teams, but the kids loved it. They all got together and they met, they created their own social communities, but there wasn't enough of those events. Sorry, guys. You, got, you saw me jump. It's because uh, my children are upstairs and uh, something got dropped on the floor. So I just, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. If I startled, that's why. Well, I know we're close to the force, so. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as I tell people, this looks really elaborate right now, what you see, but I am literally six feet away from a litter box in my basement, so. <laughs> you but and me Kevin, both. <laughs> but Kevin, let's, let's talk about, let's, let's pivot for a second, because the, what we're talking about right now is something that um, a lot of, of high, maybe high school directors... <laughs> Maybe some uh, collegiate programs are thinking, okay, let's let's we can at least reach out to our movie theaters and maybe even discuss the possibility. But let's pivot for a moment to uh, your experience with Emerson and and how you got started there and the growth of that program. But more importantly, Emerson isn't just an esports program. You have taken the Emerson College esports program and you've also created this wonderful event that got. Excellent. I, I looked at the list of speakers. I mean, when I saw that the first speaker on the list was Stephanie Ormy, I went, okay, this is good stuff. If they got Stephanie, then you're in, you're in good. But the, you've got um, the CEX Expo, which is really focused on, on six big things, right? You're talking about the critical issues about uh, the growth of collegiate esports. You want to educate and inform students and university administrators. You want to explore those career opportunities. You want to help network people together. You want to hear from thought leaders to share their insights into what they're seeing. And you want to learn how, this is what I like the most, learn how players are maximizing their mental and physical performance and addressing issues surrounding advocacy, inclusion, and legal matters related to the industry's growth. Because as we've seen, especially in the last couple of weeks, those topics about inclusion, about diversity, about advocacy are very much at the forefront right now in the esports culture. Yeah. Um, one of the main drivers, I think, uh, for me in terms of creating the event, uh, to your point, it's it's all the C's, you know, curriculum. You know, how can we create curriculum? How can we help uh, enlighten colleges on how we actually create uh, a curriculum? And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, the competition, you know, mm -hmm. how does a school that has an active, uh, you know, user base of gamers, how can they bring it to their administration? You know, what organizations are actually offering, um, you know, competitive matches? You know, what are, the, what are the publishers doing and how do they become involved formally? How do they start a varsity? program. So there's a lot of questions along those lines. And then looking at the infrastructure on the technical side, you know, managing networks, that's a huge issue with colleges and all the technical components to building a land center and, and mm -hmm. looking at all the third party developers and the companies that offer, you know, AI and coaching and analysis and streaming and all those other parts of the ecosystem. But for me, coming out of the music industry and really being a warrior in terms of defending rights and making sure that artists would, you know, be able to retain their rights so that mm -hmm. they wouldn't die broke. And from an athlete's perspective, I always felt that the model that existed with the NCAA providing scholarships and, you know, there being in, uh, you know, a lot of inequality as it related to the revenue and you know, some guys would give up their, you know, blood, sweat and tears, and then they end up with CTE and maybe they'd get an alumni plug for a job or what have you. And I thought mm -hmm. that, hey, this is really new. Is there a chance to kind of change the narrative here? Mm -hmm. And my first real introduction to that was myself and two colleagues when we were asked by some Ivy League students at Harvard and Brown uh, to help them organize uh, a conference. 
They all they wanted to do was arrange a tournament where all eight schools could come together and play and make this tournament event. And those discussions led to, hey, maybe we can create a formal conference. And this was at the same time that the Pac-12, uh, the Pac-G, you know, uh, popped up. So mm -hmm. we decided to, to move forward and help them come together. Uh, we we got Tencent uh, on the table. They were involved with potentially doing a sponsorship. Um, we knew money was an issue for all these clubs, even though mm -hmm. it was an Ivy League school. We got their alumni to want to support. Uh, Bob Kraft was uh, interested in supporting the Columbia team, and we had stakeholders that wanted to help launch these programs. But the challenge was none of the schools felt comfortable going forward. The Ivy Sports Conference felt, hey, can you help us sell some Harvard Yale uh, football tickets? We don't understand these sports. Despite my plea that, hey, you guys, you know, Princeton was Alabama in college football 100 years ago. Yeah, you know? they were. And then the, and then the Meathead Division I era came, and you guys are now relegated to, you know, the smaller end of the D1 spectrum. You right. guys could dominate esports. You don't have to worry about intelligence scholarships because the kids with brains can play league and what have you. And it was very unconvincing to them, and they didn't really want to support us. So that was one of the things that really drove me to creating the, you know, CEX, is how can we help students who really are passionate about this, um, that are passionate about, you know, potentially taking the curriculum or building a career in the space, how can we help lead them to water and begin to understand what other schools were doing, what was happening internationally, you know, what uh, industry stakeholders were there to help support their efforts and hoping that a collective body coming together would help move the needle and help the entire industry kind of rise to the occasion. See, I look at what you were just talking about and the short sightedness of colleges who, again, I don't know how esports is presented to colleges, but to me, especially when you're talking about the schools that you described. Let's take MIT, okay? While sure. Purdue, because I went to Purdue, and, and you know Indiana, so the state of Indiana, <laughs> it is a phenomenal engineering school, right? Sure. I look at the strategic goals of Purdue University, and one of their strategic goals is based around their patents, right? I look at a school like MIT, who again has a phenomenal school of engineering. And obviously it's the, I mean, we're talking about engineering and technology. MIT is number one in the world. It's amazing to me how they would look at that and go, eh, we don't know. When I look at it and go, wait a second, you're going to have some of the top minds in the world, young minds who are intrinsically motivated around playing video games already, who are going to use their smarts and their skills to develop potentially technologies on campus that could revolutionize not only this gaming industry, because again, mechanical engineering, it's, you know, with, with esports, it's down to milliseconds and clicks that are milliseconds. And how do you create efficiencies in those systems? But the patent potential that is there, I don't see how colleges and universities are just like, eh, we don't see it. We just see video games. And I don't know if that's just how the messaging is, or you have to go through so many different layers, but I think having CEX, which, which is right before PAX East, which is which I think holds about so what, 60,000 people go to that event. Yes, um, that's correct. Having that in Boston, around those, those, all those colleges right there is, I think, brilliant, quite frankly. I think it's just, it, and hopefully someday there is going to be that university president who goes in and goes, oh my God, what have we been doing? We've been, why have we been wasting time not embracing this already to a, to a level where I think they could? Yeah, you're certainly starting to see, uh, and I think with COVID, it's advanced, uh, you know, the interest, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it is baffling. It was something we struggled with, even with the Ivy, uh, because we Tencent was willing to put up sponsorship money, uh, seven figures, and in exchange for the teams to go to China to promote esports education. Okay, and uh, speaking of MIT, T.L. Taylor, you know, oh, yeah. leading educator, Mm -hmm. uh, she hosted a wonderful event in 2017, and she brought the principals from Tencent, uh, the head guy from Riot in, in China, and a woman who ran, uh, I cannot recall the university, but uh, it was Communications University, I believe, in China. And they talked about what they were doing with esports in China, and it was mind-blowing. They looked at esports just like they looked at AI. Mm -hmm. We're going to dominate this in 20 years. We're incorporating it in our schools. Communications University had a streamer training program. 
They had coaching. Like, it was unbelievable what they were doing. And TL was literally supporting all these efforts. And they actually had uh, an exhibition team, a semi-pro team from China, come over. And the MIT League of Legends team played them in some exhibition matches. And the MIT kids ended up winning. And it was funny because these kids are just engineers who are like, yeah, we'll play some league. They end up beating the semi-pro team. And all the, the Chinese players were really like upset and kind of like they felt shamed. And we felt bad for them because we were like, hey, this is great that you're coming here. But the MIT kids were like, we're just happy to play. And they didn't really have that, uh, that the same drive that you saw at some of the other schools. But to your point, when you think about technology and like the, the patenting capability and AI and machine learning, I mean, it's a hotbed of potential there. Mm -hmm. And as much as TL has done to put the school on the map, she's participated in 10 cent events over in uh, China. She's done a lot with the U S Olympic committee. She's published books and uh, the school, they haven't really embraced it, but I think some of it could have to do with, uh, you know, sports and, and activities is somewhat secondary because they're all hyper-focused on building the next, uh, whether it's an atom bomb or a cure to cancer or to COVID-19 or what have or you. A ro or a uh, robot that can walk up boxes and do flips and or yeah. <laughs> or that or that sheepdog robot that there is now. You know? <laughs> yeah, so my, my daughter's going to be a, a, a freshman in the fall and she's coming off the high school esports, uh, you know, experience. So I told her, hey, maybe there's a way I can help cultivate the community there because I think it's a perfect institution, uh, their entrepreneurship program, and also uh, the MIT Sloan uh, Sports and Analytics Conference, which is the leading sports data and analytics conference in the world. Mm. It's been around for 10 or 11 years. They dabble in esports, but it's primarily professional sports and data and analytics, but mm. it's a leading sports conference in the entire world. Well, and it's all there. Well, and here's the other part of this too, because you bring up T.L. Taylor, and I admire T. I, I admire that woman so much, not just because I, I I read her first book that she wrote on the subject of of gaming and esports, and I think that book was published in like 2012, right? Sure. Yeah. But her drive also for social justice. Yes. And you know, enekey.org, uh, you know, Gorg Group. Um, I think right now, especially when the letter came out about the the culture at Mixer Microsoft and couple that with a couple of years ago, the letter that came out from the black employee who left Google and his experience at Google. And what we've seen recently blow up as far as sexual harassment it, it not being addressed. MIT not just can take a technological lead because again, these are people who are gonna go to these companies and are going to be the bosses. They're the ones who are gonna start these companies. But sure. if they can get that experience too around social justice, about inclusivity, around diversity, in their college experience through an esports competition, because again, intrinsic motivation, hey, we're going to be playing these games anyway. If that could be baked in, that gives these kids a head start going into their professional careers where they can see something that, you know, again, some being a being an ally, a true ally, a true partner with their teammates or with their employees, their fellow employees and recognizing when things are wrong and saying, stop that, because that's that's not appropriate. And that comes from that, ex again, that experience that they have, whether it is in high school, whether it is in college. Absolutely, and I, I can't say enough about what TL's done in terms of social justice with esports, with any key and her protege, Joanna Brewer. Hmm. Uh, she spoke at CEX and ran some workshops, and uh, any college, a professor or student looking for uh, a plug and play curriculum on diversity and inclusion, please contact, go to anykey.org. Uh, they're supported by Intel and other uh, companies uh, in the ecosystem. They have laid it out, playbook, uh, class content, slides, research projects. Uh, when she, uh, when Joanna sat down and uh, I said, you know, I'd love for you to do a session at CEX, she was ready to do a six hours straight. And I said, unfortunately, I've only got an hour. <laughs> she was like, oh, okay. And she chopped it down, but she had slides. Guys, I, I was blown away at the effort that they put into this. And any school that is looking to test and trial any kind of diversity and inclusion programs, 
please contact anykey.org. They don't charge for it. It's on the house. And it's literally, to your point, in terms of, uh, you know, the racial unrest, the, the gender issues and uh, the Me Too uh, issues that are happening now in gaming, it can uh, transform, I think, a lot of campuses and, to your point, the next generation of, of esports uh, industry participants. And it's unbelievable what they've done. And, and another person I know, even though she's in D.C., but I know who's done a fantastic job of putting a spotlight on these issues. Uh, she's, she's been a guest on this podcast, and I hope to have her back soon, is Latoya Peterson, because she... Just, sure, great writer she, as well. Yeah. Fantastic <laughs> writer and just lays... And I have her... She's gonna. She might blush when she hears this. I have her as like when she tweets something, I get an alert. Like that's the kind of person. Like when I want to make sure when Latoya puts something out there that I notice it because, again, she also has done a fantastic job. I think of of doing that right now, especially now with with uh, with and not, not just in gaming, but with everything else that we're facing right now in this country. And and I hope that that esports, you know, when we have educators involved in it. You know, I, I, I equated this to the longest time. Why do we have these 20 and 30 year olds who don't know how to act in this space? Well, because these kids grew up and parents really had a hands off approach. They did not engage their kids in these spaces. And that to me right now is, in, is something that is still lacking in a lot of ways is that we don't have enough adult adults in the space with kids to, to, to support them just as parents, you know, parents, again, sometimes they're afraid to ask the questions and sometimes kids don't feel like they're partners, but we need to find ways to make our kids partners with us in this space to show us what they're playing, to show us what they're doing. And I think that also can impact uh, the future. You know, as you said, you know, you're talking, you know, your daughter was at school in Indiana uh, and hopefully you can carry that culture into MIT. You're an involved dad who knows this field. My kids, I've been advocating to get esports into their school for years. It's been an uphill battle, but um, again, I'm that person who I know what their gaming experience is. I know what they're dealing with because we have those conversations. It's it's just something that I hope I hope uh, you know as we look at this opportunity, it isn't just technological and event planning, but it's also again the social justice issue. Because again, as we're finding the jobs and and there's scholarships involved now, to me, esports is very much an issue of technological equity and a very much an issue of social justice right now because of the connections that it's making in the world. You're absolutely <laughs> right. And, and one of the things uh, that Garvey Candela from Twitch, you know, really addressed, it's, it's interesting that all these issues are coming about with Twitch and streaming and, and the culture. He spoke at uh, CEX uh, the year before last, and mm -hmm. he talked about, you've got all these creatives on Twitch and none of them are formally trained yeah. to advocate for brands to understand their audience and to project themselves in a manner that uh, I guess is has socially redeeming value. And, and we need to begin to educate these kids and letting them know this is a powerful platform. You have to be fair and inclusive and follow up on the trends that you saw in Smash, for example. The, there was this council that kind of governed Smash that was all a bunch of gamers. And there was a kid, a, a pro that I, his name completely escapes me and that's showing my age. That's but okay. he told me how he stepped off of this governing council to allow a woman gamer to come in and advocate because he felt that her voice mattered. And she wasn't a, a top killer pro player, but he felt that she had enough to offer that had uh, enough value that her voice needed to be heard at that stage. And, and I thought that that was a credit to the potential for a culture change to come through esports, through this next generation of esports uh, executives. So, Kevin, as we're starting to wrap up here, um, you know, CEX has a future, right? I, I, I'm sure the event's going to happen in some form. Um, and again, looking at what the goals are around CEX, one of the things is about educating not just uh, people who are interested in collegiate esports, but also university administrators. And last week, I asked, uh, on my last episode, I asked Dr. Haskell about post-COVID, as, as states have lost tax revenue, uh, people still have this mindset, and this was something I think on the panel you even talked about because there was somebody who said that they felt really, you know, that we were cheap. You know, esports is a cheap thing to have on campus. And as I, I put in the chat, you know, cheap doesn't mean safe. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> it doesn't. How important is CEX going to be next year to help people see the value of collegiate esports? Do you feel? 
Well, I, I think we're going to play an instrumental role because what I've seen just you know during the COVID crisis is I've seen a, a surge in interest. Uh, and I think largely due to the potential absence of collegiate uh, sports. Uh, over the last week, I mean, how many positive cases have popped up, you know, with collegiate football? Mm-hmm. And you've got some of these uh, Power Five schools that football is their bread and butter, mm-hmm. you know? And you, you're thinking about, okay, where does it go from here? And then you're looking at the leadership change at Learfield, right? This CEO is a digital first guy, right? Mm-hmm. And then you're seeing all the activity with Mainline and how they're now taking a, do, a new approach to uh, the sports rights side of the collegiate uh, industry and now trying to create more, I, I don't know if you saw the Big Ten announcement, uh, the Big 12, I'm sorry. Okay, I was gonna say, like, usually uh, I'm up on the Big Ten stuff, just yeah, because. Yeah, yeah, Big 12, they just made an announcement about a Madden tournament with the Big 12, that's, uh, that's Learfield and Mainline. Okay. Um, so. I actually think that it, it, it's growing. It will continue to grow, and I think that college esports is now going to be sitting at us uh, at the table with all the other sports. It will never be basketball and football within the next ten years, mm-hmm. but I think you're going to start to see media rights and deals, even for con- conventional TV, starting to pop up. Um, ECAC that day they they announced uh, esports U that yeah. deal with uh, was it light. Lightyear or uh, uh, LTN, sorry, uh, which is uh, a work in progress, you know, mm-hmm. and, I, and I know it's not the first time that you've seen these types of traditional media deals, but I do think you will start to see more activity, more sponsorships, more brands, um, more formality, because I look at it beyond just the, you know, the varsity program lens. I'm looking at the retention side of it. Uh, think about the career development impact of mm-hmm. all these kids, uh, like Emerson, all the kids that had their internships canceled, that because of social distancing and things, they can't go into companies and work. Mm-hmm. Um, so all those career development kind of programs have to refocus on how can they put butts in seats and graduate these kids into careers and jobs and things like that, right? Looking at the community beyond varsity and intramurals and so on. Um, I think they're going to have to take a larger look at how to retain kids in virtual environments now. Half of the actual campus is going to be virtual. They mm-hmm. may never touch the campus. How can they be engaged through esports? So I think that uh, as a value proposition, CEX has become more important in terms of helping to advocate for esports, but educate and enlighten you know, the technical sides of universities, the career service development side, um, all the university administrators that are looking at the value proposition for the collegiate experience. And what does that look like if kids can't come on campus? It has to include esports. Uh, so I, I think that we're in a better position, uh, and uh, I'm already seeing the benefits and the results of it. We just recently signed deals with three different partners to host virtual versions of CEX, mm-hmm. one in Brazil, one in India, and one in Africa. Oh, uh, very, also, very, uh, very cool. I want to yeah. be involved. Yeah. If you can have me involved, I would love to be involved. I already in have you on my list, so I just Perfect. figured I'd let you know because I've already got you slated because I want – the stakeholders in India to hear from people like you, as opposed to, and no disrespect to any publishers and their and other pre-existing collegiate organizations and using and their retreaded model. I want them to hear from people like you who are student first, you know, who have an, an organic approach to esports development, mm. um, so that you can convey to them the power of the 360 degrees of collegiate or high school esports. It's beyond just a competition. Mm-hmm. And all the benefits in taking a fresh approach, they don't have the limitations like the NCAAs of the world, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, in Africa, it's gonna be a content, continent-wide event. So it's gonna take place in English and then be translated into French. In Brazil, it's Amazing. gonna be in Brazilian Portuguese. I don't know what they're gonna say, but I have a very competent student uh, named Rick Manas from Northeastern uh, University. He helped to start that D1 varsity program that they have. He's completely taking the, the helm. He's found Brazilian speakers. We're gonna be working with MIBR, wait, stuff like wait. that. I have so, to say, if, yeah. you have, if, if, if you're gonna have me on something for Brazil, my sister lived in Brazil for a number of years. She's absolutely fluent in the language. I can just have my sister and I just 
doing the presentation well, together. That would be awesome. I, I'll but. tell you, if you can do that, then you're in the lineup for Brazil because it's going to be a stretch for the Americans because Rick is going to have to translate and mm -hmm. annotate. But if you can do something organic, they'll love you. Okay. Uh, I can honestly say they will love you. Um, it's all well, right now. We're working on dates and finalizing them because the entire world is dealing with COVID-19 and trying sure. to figure out what the school look like. But India is going to be super exciting. There are roughly 10,000 different schools that are active and it's just so exciting. I've already started working with an American company that uh, Mark Wahlberg, Kurt Warner from uh, the, the old NFL quarterback mm -hmm. and Mike yep. Ditka, they're all part of this company that's actually working with um, the Indian government to help bring college sports to India. They started with tackle football of all, of all sports eight years ago and they've been cultivating the market and now eSports has really popped up on their radar they mm -hmm. reached out to me to host CEX, and I've been helping them with some of their structure and building relationships. So I'm super excited about that. In Africa, same thing, emerging market. They're doing a lot with uh, professional soccer there. In Brazil, super excited. We're working with the guy that was uh, used to run ESL in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So super exciting. And we're also going to do CEX in the U.S., and we're trying to figure out the best time because we don't want to be a burden to all the educators trying to, un, you know, onboard new uh, hybrid programs or what have you. So we're probably looking at late September to early October so that we can let everyone get adjusted and bring CEX to the virtual landscape and hopefully include an infinite amount of U.S. colleges and just kind of sure. push the needle on this. So super excited about that. It sounds it sounds so wonderful. and. One of the things you did bring up too in all of this in the shifting landscapes and something that uh, I think a lot of people may not realize is that the NCAA recently made a lot of big changes in their structure for how they support student athletes. And it was a long time coming. Um, you know, a couple of years ago when the Northwestern students uh, sued the NCAA for their rights to be able to monetize themselves, uh, I argued that Esports was going to be the thing, one of the thing, one of the things that was going to push that button to say like, hey, you know, we've got these kids who are already making money, but as as professional gamers or streamers before they even set foot on campus, you know, if the NCAA wants to get involved with esports, they're going to have to clean up that aspect for because you can't tell the esports kids, hey, you can make money off your likeness and go back and tell the basketball and the football players, no, you can't, you know, that's right. so. Um, I think. And I, and I, AJ Dimmick kind of gave me one of these things on, on Twitter, and I always pull up that tweet because I'm like, hey, see, <laughs> see? But um, it, it, there is going to be, I don't know how the NCAA is going to get into this. I think, you know, the Big Ten has been out on esports now for a while. They've kind of sure. self organized, they ran their own League of Legends thing. I was surprised a few years ago when the Pac 12 really was all on board and then they backed off suddenly. Um, it was close. It was. It was. It was one. It was yeah. one university president. I think it was Arizona State's university president yeah. who said, "No, That's no correct. thanks." Yeah. We want to look at this more. Um, ECAC. I, I think they're they're a tremendous organization that is really taking a lead in this. I know uh, Tyrell Appleton is is he's he is out there promoting like crazy all the stuff that oh, he's yeah. doing. He is he is absolutely. And I've had him on the podcast, and he is uh, he's humble and and also very. Uh, out there, like, I, I don't know how you put the both together, Energy. but he he just does yeah. it, yeah. And yeah. I think he's been a really good face for the ECAC uh, in all this. So I really look forward to the growth of CEX. I look forward to us connecting more uh, over the years. I know we've already been connected before, but I hope this episode for some people, as they're getting into the next year. I mean, obviously you've learned a little bit about rap culture today. You've <laughs> learned we we've discussed a lot about what the collegiate landscape looks like and hopefully ways that people can connect and learn more about not just the collegiate landscape, I know it's gonna be collegiate focused, but also just how all this fits together on a global stage. Kevin Mitchell, thank you so much for being on the Academy of Esports podcast today. James, thank you, this is a pleasure. It was a long time coming and I really appreciate everything that you're doing. Uh, you know, you're, one of the pillars of the community and i don't know where we would all be you're our conscious you're our future you're our catalyst and uh the phoenix uh you know there's a lot of other things too um especially if there's no haggis involved or oh. any kind of irish ale um but 
still, honestly, I, I love what you're doing. Thanks for for having me, and I'd love to come back and and we'll talk, you know, hip hop '80s, '90s uh, in the future, and um, just talk more about um, how we can support this this amazing industry that's on the horizon. You know, thanks again. This was awesome. Absolutely. Thank you again, Kevin. That will do it for this week on the Academy of Esports. I've been your host, James O'Hagan. Esports are organized competitive video games allowing schools to redefine their athletic culture, diversify opportunities for student participation, promote good physical and mental health, increase collegiate scholarship pathways, and play games. We can never forget the importance of play. The mission of the Academy of Esports is to support these ideals. The vision of the Academy of Esports is for all students to experience the fun and joy of playing competitive video games. You may follow me on Twitter, at Jim O'Hagan. That's at J-I-M-O-H-A-G-A-N. And through the Academy of Esports account, at T-A-O Esports. It's a great way to get the latest blog posts, podcast episodes, and news coming out of esports and education. And remember, you can continue your engagement by going to www.taoesports.com. You can also connect through Facebook at www.facebook.com slash TAO Esports. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to our time again next week.